Good morning. Uh, this meeting of the Maryland Public Service Commission will come to order. Apologize for the late start today. We're having some technical difficulties with our video system. Before we get started today with today's docket, I'd like to recognize one of our uh, newest employees, Anna Joy Thompson. Is Anna Joy here? Hi. Good morning. Anna Joy started this past Monday. She's one of our new regulatory economists in the electricity division. Um, she's a recent graduate of the University of Maryland in College Park, so we have a, a Terrapin, um, and she graduated with a degree in agricultural and uh, economic resources. Uh, prior to joining the commission, she was a research assistant at the U UMD, and she was writing a book commemorating the 20th anniversary of Maryland's Smart Growth Program. So, Anna Joy, welcome to the commission. We look forward to having you upstairs. Next up, we have uh, minutes from the administrative meeting of uh, July 17th. Uh, do I have a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I move we adopt the minutes from the July 17th administrative meeting. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. The minutes are approved. Mr. Secretary. Mr. Chairman, we have uh, six items on the consent agenda this morning, but before we begin with that, we are actually going to, on the administrative agenda, we're going to defer one item. It is uh, number 13, Dan's Mountain Solar to a future administrative meeting. Thank you. Items one through six. Item one, Novo Energy Services, LLC, filed an application for a license to supply electricity or electric generation services in the state of Maryland. Items two, three, and four are filings from the Potomac Edison Company, Delmarva Power and Light Company, Potomac Electric Power Company. They're all updated SOS standard offer service tariff filings. Item five is Life Energy LLC and NRG Retail LLC. It's a notice of contract assignment pursuant to Comar 2053.07.12. Finally, item six is Baltimore Gas and Electric Company filed revised surcharges reflecting the amendments opposed this year to the Montgomery County fuel energy tax. Thank you. Uh, do commissioners have questions on any of these items? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I would have a few questions for item number five. Do we have staff available? Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Michael Jang on behalf of staff. Good morning. Um, we received uh, comments from the Office of People's Council regarding the notice that was uh, sent to customers uh, and questions regarding the information provided to customers about the budget billing plan. Uh, have we heard from the company or did staff any, have any response to the Office of People's Council's comment? Yes. Um, the company has stated that none of its customers in Maryland are under budget billing. Okay. Um, see, the Office People's Council is here. Do they have any response to it? Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, Jacob Alcentor on behalf of the Maryland Office of People's Council. Uh, I have been in contact with both staff and with uh, Council for uh, NRG, and they have informed me that uh, they don't have any budget billing customers. So based on those representations, the concerns that we raised in our letter uh, are essentially moot. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, are there motions? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. For item number one, I move that we grant the company license to operate as an electricity supplier in Maryland, limited to broker services for the customer classes and service territories applied for and recommended by staff. That we direct the company to provide marketing and training materials specific to its Maryland operations to the commission staff 30 days prior to utilization of the materials in Maryland, and direct the company to file notice with the commission within 30 days of any changes to the information in the application. For items number two, three, and four, I move that we accept the tariff revisions for filing with an effective date of September 1st, 2019. For item number five, I move that we note the filing. And for item number six, I move that we note the filing and grant a waiver of the 30-day notice period required under Public Utilities Article Section 4-203A. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The motions are approved. Mr. Chairman, um, we're going to call items 7 and 8, I think, collectively together. Uh, first two items on the administrative agenda. Um, would you like the parties to sit at the... Yes, table? why don't the parties come uh, join us at the table. So item 7 is Checker Cab Associated Inc. and Yellow Cab Associated Inc. filed a request for authorization to operate as a taxi cab association in Baltimore City. And item eight is WHC BAL Association LLZ TA Z Trip Association also filed an application for authorization for Z Trip to operate as a taxi cab association in Baltimore City. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Mr. Chairman. 
I know we have two items here. Are they split amongst the uh, <laughs> staff council? Okay. <laughs> they are. Mr. Gregor, why don't you begin? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. James Gregor on behalf of staff. This item on the agenda concerns an application submitted on behalf of Super Taxi, Checker Cab Association Incorporated, and Yellow Cab Association Incorporated, requesting approval to operate as taxi cab associations within Baltimore City. Public Utilities Article Section 10-205A states that a permit may not be assigned or transferred unless, after investigation, the Commission approves the assignment or transfer as best for the public welfare and convenience. <coughs> Comar Section 20.90.02.08 further states that every taxi cab shall be operated as a unit of an effective operating group of sufficient number and equipped with communication facilities for rendering satisfactory call service. Owners of small fleets or single taxi cabs shall operate as members of a satisfactory operating association. And the association shall be equipped with adequate call facilities, so located as to serve all parts of the jurisdiction, and to make possible the effective direction and supervision of call service. On May 22, 2019, a request for commission approval to operate as Baltimore City Taxi Cab Associations was filed on behalf of Checker Cab Association, Inc. and Yellow Cab Association, Inc. Transportation Division, or Division asked prospective taxi cab associations <coughs> a series of questions in order to determine the effectiveness of the organizations. The answers to these questions assist the Transportation Division in determining intent, capability, preparedness, and operational efficiency of newly proposed associations. The Transportation Division has also reviewed criminal records, corporate standing in Maryland, and current history of compliance, complaints, and performance. Based on the petition and the subsequent information provided by the companies, staff finds that they will operate as effective taxi cab associations. Checker Cab Association Incorporated and Yellow Cab Association Incorporated are in good standing with the Maryland State Department of Assessment and Taxation. The officers of these two associations have many years of experience operating taxi cab companies in both the state of Maryland and abroad. The associations will maintain at their business and maintenance facility a system of record keeping including manifests, annual reports, calls for service, fuel and meter receipts, complaints, and driver records. <coughs> Insurance coverage will be monitored by the associations on a regular schedule. The existing color scheme will remain unchanged for vehicles operating under both associations. SuperTaxi additionally requests that upon approval for the newly formed associations to operate, that the 538 Baltimore City Taxi Cab Permits currently under the active Yellow and Checker Cab Associations be accepted into the new Checker Cab Association Incorporated and Yellow Cab Association Incorporated. Therefore, staff recommends that the Commission approve the request by Checker Cab Association Inc. and Yellow Cab Association Inc. to close the existing Taxi Cab Associations and authorize the new companies to operate as Baltimore City Taxi Cab Associations. The recommendation is contingent upon compliance by both associations with all requirements established by the Commission related to, the offer, or related to offering taxi cab services in Baltimore City within 30 days of the date of Commission approval. Thank you. Mr. Gregor, before we pr proceed, just uh, th this is relatively confusing because the names are all the same, or maybe they're not the same. Is Checker Cab Association Incorporated different than Checker Cab Asos Inc.? No. So right now there is a active Checker Cab Association and a newly formed legal entity, the Checker Cab Association Incorporated. Uh, same for Yellow Cab. What this filing is requesting is to deactivate the old or the currently active Yellow Cab and Checker Cab and authorize the new Checker Cab Association Incorporated and new Yellow Cab Association Incorporated to operate. So they would essentially be taking their place. Okay. Um, an org chart might be helpful in, with respect to this filing, but uh, let's move on to uh, just on Mr. that. Speed, in, yes. It's the same owners, is that correct? Yes, all they're owned. all owned by the okay. same parent so company. So same company names and same company owners. Yes, that's correct, Commissioner. Great. All right, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners Lloyd Spivak for the Commission staffs. Item number eight is the application of WHC BAL Association LLC trading as Z-Trip Association, filed on June 7, 2019, requesting approval to operate as a new Baltimore City Taxi Cab Association. Uh, the law and the standards that apply are the same as for the previous item. 
Uh, as an initial matter, ZTRIP has submitted 10 permits for inclusion in the new association, but more are expected to be transferred gradually after the new association is in operation. Staff has reviewed the filing, obtained answers to data requests, visited ZTRIP's premises, reviewed the one comment that was received in response to notice sent to existing associations. Staff does believe that ZTRIP uh, will meet all the requirements to form and operate an effective and new taxi cab association in Baltimore City. <coughs> Staff recommends the Commission approve the request by ZTRIP for authorization to operate as a Baltimore City taxi cab association contingent upon the association's compliance with all the requirements established by the Commission related to ta offering taxi cab services in Baltimore City uh, within 30 days of the Commission's approval. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Spivak. Um, I guess we have the, the same council for the Checker Cab Association, Yellow Cab Association, and WHCBAL Association. Is that right? Correct, Your Honor. Good morning. Good, good morning, Your Honor. D David Bugelman with Gordon Feinblatt on behalf of the applicants with um, both uh, requests. I have with me um, Dwight Kynes um, from the applicants. He's, he's here to answer any um, substantive questions about these applications. Um, we're here to offer our concurrence with staff and to uh, answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Bugelman, it seems like um, their WHC will be trading as ZTRIP. Is that correct? Correct, Your Honor. Okay. And how many vehicles will ZTRIP be um, operating in the city? I think initially, um, Your Honor, and, and Mr. Kynes can elaborate a bit, if you look at one of the attachments to the application, <coughs> there is a schedule of permits that I think maybe it was in a supplemental filing. Exhibit B, is that Exactly. Right? Okay. Um, so th those are the initial permits that would be um, transferred over. Ten. Correct, Your Honor. Okay. Um, with respect to the, the second item, uh, item number uh, seven, so item, item number eight, um, the current vehicles operated by Service Cab Company Incorporated will be rebranded to Z-Trip, but your transmittal letter states that Yellow Cab and Checker Cab vehicles will continue to operate. Um, what does that mean? Will they be rebranded eventually to Z-Trip vehicles as well? Yes, uh, Dwight Kynes with Yellow Checker Cab Association. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, the t intention is to start out with 10 eventually get to 538 which is a pretty big job and we have over 538 probably 350 of those permit holders are individual owners that we don't want to force to paint their vehicle and that sort of thing so we we will there'll be a blend of taxi cabs out there there'll be yellow ones orange ones and silver ones for a while but the intention is to have all of the permit holders that is, is under the checker and yellow cab umbrella permit holders held by the company not the 300 individual permit holders but the, the 200 that are held by the company uh, combine all those permit holders into service cab company Inc so it gets more and more confusing right now it, it, it definitely does so the, the 200 vehicles the majority of which are yellow and checker will eventually be rebranded to Z trip cars eventually all of them will okay including the 300 that are owned by Correct. It, as, <coughs> as owners buy a new vehicle or they, they also have the option of painting their car silver and 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 having new look which I won't go into right now uh, and you know, we'll, we'll figure out ways to arrange financing for them if they want to you know for a $500 uh, paint job but it'll be their choice as you're probably aware um, the DC taxi cab Commission a few years ago required that their taxi cabs be a uniform color in the city mm -hmm. they provided their uh, uh, independent taxi operators a, a phase in period uh, it was a number of years maybe four or five years plus a subsidy um, is there a time limit that you propose that these other 300 cabs will be rebranded as Z-Trip vehicles? We, we are asking that they do it as they replace their vehicles. So some could go as long as, as four or five. We hope not, but um, uh, those that are buying their cars replacement vehicles next year, we, we'd ask to be silver. And, and if they, for instance, have a 215 vehicle that doesn't come off the street until 2025 or 2027 uh, then that's when they they'd have the option they'd have the option to run it as a yellow colored car or an orange colored car uh, until they until they replace it mr. Gorman how, how many licensed taxi cabs do we have operating in the city of Baltimore uh, currently 1,000 a little over 1,000 1,073 permits all right so so eventually as of this proposal it'll be about half the 
city cabs will be Z trip. Right, not quite half. I was curious, uh, St. George, Utah, that, that's where the dispatch center is going to be located? Yes, sir. That's, so where, that's where we dispatch and uh, calls and take trips right now. Okay. Uh, would residents in Baltimore City be calling a Utah number or a local number that's um, transferred to Utah? They, call, they would call the number that Yellow and Checker Cab have always been, the 410-685-1212. It just gets forwarded to Utah. Okay. We've been using that call center for probably two years, maybe three. Can our staff council elaborate on the the one comment that we received uh, with respect to the fact that Z Trip looks like a, perhaps an Uber or a, or an app based service? Um, there's not really that much to say about it. I mean, who was it, the comment from? You want me to answer that? Or? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, the the comment was from uh, a taxi cab company in the county. Baltimore County, and they were making reference to one of the ways that the Z Trip taxi cabs will be dispatched um, is the current one of the current ways they dispatch the yellow checker cabs, and that is through the smartphone application. And the the name of the smartphone application is Z Trip, and I believe that that was the confusion. Was this individual believed that they were going to be operating as a a TNC, and that they were operating under this TNC application and um, at that point that that individual or that company didn't have the full information that that is the current one of the current ways that these um, taxi cabs are dispatched okay. thank you uh, commissioners uh, Commissioner Richard yeah I was interested in, in the app itself it's my understanding if I read these uh, filings correctly that already the uh, checker and yellow cabs are using uh, an app is that correct same app we use the trip app to dispatch yellow and checker cabs okay. and so when when you go onto the app I mean do you specifically request either a yellow cab or a, a, a checker cab or does it basically just go out and like uber you get the uh, I guess the closest cab yeah you absolutely cab. get the closest cab okay uh, it, it, it's really just another way to order a taxi cab. Okay. Eighty-five percent of our trips still are dis. Our, our orders are taken by telephone. Uh, not even ten percent are taken by the app. Um, but yeah, it, it, they will. The, right now, if a customer calls our call center or goes on the Z Trip app, they will either get a yellow cab or a checker cab. Okay. And then when you bring in the uh, Z Trip, the Z Trip, yep. it'll. It, you, you may think you're getting a Z Trip or Z, Z Car, but but yep. you could get any of the three. Yep. So that's, yes, that's the way this, this is no work. Okay, I, I just wanted to, so, so effectively you're already going to be uh, operating as a, a cohesive company, all three companies. In Absolutely. One. And we'd like to say that their app looks like ours. Very good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Gorman, I, I wanted to ask you um, on item seven, there's a list attached to the 538 permit holders. Does each one of those permits apply to one vehicle only uh, yes sir so so all these subsidiary cab companies only have one car correct okay I just want to make certain of that and then to the company can you help me understand why why are we doing this it's not clear what the motivation of the companies were in per proceeding down this path as far as item number seven goes um, the, well the, I, item number eight is we, we we're in the process of, of selling uh, our Baltimore taxi companies, when I say our, I mean Super Taxi that owns them now, to, w, to WHC. So WHC's brand around the country, there's, WHC is in probably uh, 21 markets right now. Uh, they, are, we're, they are in the process of buying the last eight or nine cab companies that TransDev owns, or I'm sorry, Super Taxi owns, um, uh, to, to get to probably 25 or 26. The brand that they use around the com country is Z-Trip. As far as this intermediate step with Checker Cab Asos and Yellow Cab Asos, our feeling is that we need to have this intermediate step. We're, we're in the process of doing a stock sale, uh, but this intermediate step provides some, some protection from liabilities to the new company. The TransDev, uh, again, SuperTaxi. SuperTaxi is the holder. TransDev is above SuperTaxi. Uh, SuperTaxi will continue to have the responsibility for those after, tra after the transaction is complete. So that's the reason for the intermediate step. Thank you for that, because I suspected it was a liability kind of protection thing, and I appreciate you uh, being forthcoming with that. 
what liabilities are being shielded? Do you, do you, can you give me a sense of that? Well, I mean, the, the easy one is, is accident claims that are in, in place right now uh, that will have to be settled by super taxi, and there's reserves set aside, money set aside. They'll be, they'll be uh, uh, adjusted over the next couple of years. But uh, there can be liabilities for leases and um, other lawsuits that, again, will stay with Super Taxi and not come with a new company. If and when the uh, item number seven is approved, then we will have a stock transfer of Checker Cabasos and Yellow Cabasos to WHC. So WHC will be the holder of all three uh, taxi associations, hopefully soon. And does the staff believe there's no loss of any um, right of Maryland citizens uh, to any action, litigation, suit, et cetera, and this liability shielding? There's always a little bit of loss of, of right with liability shielding because that's the purpose of it. Uh, but why know, is that? Any, I'm, asking you, why that, I'm asking you why that's in the interest of the citizens. Um, it's in the interest of the citizens in the sense that it allows the companies to operate in the first place. I mean, I, this is this is a very general question of corporate law. In in, in essence, th why does a corporation exist? And it is for exactly that purpose. It shields the owners in some way from personal liability. Right, but and but that's this, all that's going on here. I understand that generally, but this specific action does it result in the loss of any action or actionable uh, suit on the part of a citizen of Maryland who is who has a right right now to recover under that corporate law? Ultimately, probably not. Uh, and, you know the existing corporations there are many and numerous uh, for the for these permits uh, from the sound of it ultimately there will be fewer and if anything that would actually increase the um, so increase the availability of assets to respond to any any lawsuits so no pending there. action right now will be affected if we were to approve these today is that what you're telling me that's correct okay that's enough thank you Yep. Matter if I had something, I mentioned Transdev a couple times, which is the holding company for Super Taxi. Transdev is a huge international company. Uh, the taxi cab business was just a very small uh, portion of, of what they do. Uh, but again, they're trains and buses and they MTA mobility contracts and that sort of thing. And, and those are the folks that will remain in place to handle any kind of obligation that's there. Yeah, I appreciate that. I just, my sense I as I read this, um, the, read these applications was this was a, a legal maneuver to protect from somebody and I'm trying to figure out okay so who's gonna lose on the other end so who's, who's gonna lose that right I am actually my impression is it's, it's more a legal means to facilitate the transfer of ownership than to change the liability structure or reduce the liability structure I'm just the company just confirmed my suspicions when I read it, so you can refute that, but uh, that's not what the company said. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one question uh, for our, our staff: Does uh, Z Trip currently operate as a TNC in Maryland? Uh, they do not, sir. They do not. Okay. Thank you. Well, obviously, the the tax cab business is. Uh, it's one that's been in the city for for a long time, but it's a it's a difficult trade, difficult industry to be in right now. Mr. Hines, it sounds like you've have a number of years of experience in taxi cab operations. Thirty. Thirty, and uh, particularly with Uber and Lyft and other TNCs, it it obviously is cutting into the number of uh, rides that taxi cab uh, drivers perform on a daily basis. I every now and again I go over to the Renaissance Hotel over by the Inner Harbor where we don't even have a taxi cab stand anymore. It's sort of like they park in the fire lane because the city removed the taxi cab stand. Um, but the reputation of city cabs hasn't been that great despite the efforts of our transportation division. Uh, you see cabs in disrepair. You see uh, drivers not wearing the appropriate attire as required by Comar to have a clean appearance and shorts and a tank top doesn't typically cut it. So uh, I'm asking for your, your commitment that your the, co the cabs under your operation will conform to our regulations absolutely we're making a big investment in vehicles we're starting with 10 hope to have 100 by the end of the year uh, thus it's an exciting time for the taxi cab business we we feel like we've turned the corner and, and found our niche 
um, we'll continue to cooperate with staff and the and the commission in making sure that that we have the quality that that you expect from Thank taxi cabs. I appreciate that, and I'm sure Mr. Gorman will be uh, doing surprise inspections every now and again with our uh, other inspectors on the road. With that, is uh, is there a motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. With respect to item number seven, I move we approve the request by Checker Cab Associ Inc. and Yellow Cab Associ Inc. to close the existing taxi cab associations and grant the new company's authority to operate as Baltimore City Taxi Cab Associations contingent upon compliance by both associations with all requirements established by the Commission related to offering taxicab services in Baltimore within 30 days. And for item number eight, I move we approve the request by Z-Trip for authority to operate as a Baltimore City Taxicab Association contingent upon the association's compliance with all the requirements established by the Commission related to offering taxicab services in Baltimore City within 30 days. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The uh, two motions are approved. Thank you very much. But before we move to the the next item, and the, these parties are dismissed, I'd like to um, discuss retail supply issues for, for just a moment. Uh, it was actually last July when I, I joined the commission that I was discussing some of these issues. And as a retail supply customer in the state of the past 10 years, um, I like to think that I'm fully aware of, of the operations and the, the regulations under which our retail supply community operate. Um, as most people know, most Marylanders, maybe with the exception of rate payers in some of the cooperatives and municipal territories, can choose their supplier with respect to electric and natural gas that's delivered to their home by their natural, um, by their local utility, whether it be Pepco, BGE, or Del Marva. Uh, statewide, right now, approximately 20% of our customers for both natural gas and electricity choose electric supply. It's actually 19.8% for electricity and 20.3% for, for gas. And as this is the policy of the state, uh, the, the PSC is, is supportive of the retail supply industry because customer gets, they get benefits in the form of potentially lower rates because these various suppliers are competing with each other. Uh, they receive product offerings including 100% uh, renewable supply, and they receive promotional incentives such as gift cards, uh, movie tickets, airline miles. I actually just received a, a promotional offer for uh, American Airlines, 12,000 miles. Um, however, in any market that operates uh, in a competitive sales environment, we have rules to protect our, our customers in the, in the state. Uh, and in fact, Maryland has very extensive Comar regulations in addition to to state law that allows us to police these markets and to regulate the, the industry. Um, however, in my experience, I'm growing uh, increasingly concerned with some of the practices of a, a minority of suppliers as informed by re my review of the monthly uh, reports from the Consumer Affairs Division. Uh, whether the violation, uh, either technical or blatant, is made by the supplier directly or an agent of the supplier, um, that really makes no difference and the PSC is committed to uh, its vigilance and oversight of the retail supply market. And we will bring enforcement actions um, if our rules and our laws are not followed to the letter. I can tell you as a resident of Prince George's County, I receive uh, folks who knock on my door this summer uh, attempting to get me to change retail suppliers. It's not an easy job in the summer. You have teenagers um, knocking door to door. Um, with their clipboard or with their iPad trying to sign up customers. And this is a difficult business. They're, they're not selling candy bars. They're selling a, a pretty complicated product. And when I take a look at this um, advertisement that I, I received, on the back side there's a ton of fine print and I actually couldn't find anything in violation of the Commission's regs here. But it explains what the product is. Is it a variable product? Is it, is it a fixed product? Um, are you receiving renewable supply or not, what is the length of your contract, what are the terms, whether there are any um, termination fees. And I can tell you when the kids knock on my door trying to get my service ID number and I start discussing what the SOS rate is with them, for the most part they don't know what SOS means, they just want my number. Um, this is a concern to me because as I just stated, as agents for the supplier, they are equally as responsible for the actions 
directly made by the supplier. So what I'm asking today is for our utilities to, to be on the watch for suspicious trends of new enrollments, and I know our larger utilities uh, have the ability and are committed to doing that. I'm asking our residents if they suspect any uh, concerns or deceptive practices to reach out to our um, Consumer Affairs Division at the PSC and to file complaints. And I'm also asking for the retail supply industry themselves to do some self-policing and let us know if they're aware of um, any suspicious or suspect activity that they see amongst their competition. Long story short, ultimately, I want our retail supply industry in the state to, to thrive and deliver benefits to customers throughout the state. But we're never going to get beyond that 20% threshold, in my opinion, if customers associate all offers that they receive, whether they be legitimate offers or potential scam offers. Um, I know that my colleagues are also committed, and I'm actually looking forward uh, to the PSC rolling out new ways to oversee this market um, and both to support retail competition in Maryland. Earlier this year, a law was actually passed where we're going to be improving our uh, customer education of the retail supply, as well as to rolling out some new uh, retail supply choice websites for both the natural gas and the electric industries. So this is a, a major concern of mine, and I know we approved a retail supply application just a few minutes ago, the first item on the docket, uh, Novo Energy. Uh, but this is something that we're going to have continued vigilance and uh, oversight of, of this market. Thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary. Next item on the agenda, item number nine, is Baltimore Gas and Electric Company filed <coughs> a request for a mandatory waiver of a CPCN requirement to modify an existing overhead transmission line. Mr. Gregor and, and Counsel for BGE, why don't why don't you sit at the table? Yeah. We have extra seats at the table at BGE. Um, Counsel for PPRP. And Office of People's Council, if they, oh, there's Mr. Alexander. Hello. Mr. Gregor. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, once again, James Gregor on behalf of staff. This item concerns a request by Baltimore Gas and Electric Company for a mandatory waiver of the requirement to obtain a certificate of public convenience and necessity in connection with specific work to be performed on a portion of an existing 230 kV overhead transmission line located in Baltimore and Harford counties. Public Utilities Article Section 7-207 requires an electric company to obtain a CPCN prior to commencing construction of an overhead transmission line that is designed to carry a voltage in excess of 69,000 volts. PUA Section 7-207A1I defines the term construction as any physical change at the site, including fabrication, erection, installation, or demolition. PUA Section 7-207B3I states that unless a certificate of public convenience and necessity for construction is first obtained from the Commission, an electric company may not begin construction of an overhead transmission line that is designed to carry a voltage in excess of 69 kV. PUA Section 7-207B3II allows the Commission to waive the requirement in subparagraph I for good cause. PUA Section 7-207B4I is a mandatory waiver provision which states that the Commission shall waive the CPCN requirement if it finds that the construction does not, one, require the electric company to obtain new real property or additional rights of way through eminent domain, or two, require larger or higher structures to accommodate increased voltage or larger conductors. This project involves the reconductoring and modification of existing of the existing Coniston to Northwest Number Two Double Circuit 230 kV transmission line. Specifically, it will involve the modification of certain lattice tower structures and replacing other lattice tower structures, and replacing the the existing conductors. This project is directed by PJM in support of PJM Project 9A, as detailed in case number 9471, the Transhorse Maryland case. 
BGE is currently engaged in the engineering design phase and the material procurement phase of this project. All work is projected to take place within BGE's existing transmission corridor that runs between the Northwest Number 2 and Conestone substations. No real property or additional rights of way will be required to complete this project. In order to obtain a mandatory waiver of the CPCN requirement, the project must not require any real property or rights of way acquired through eminent domain nor require any larger or higher structures needed to accommodate increased voltage or larger conductors. Following review of the company's initial filing and the subsequent responses to data requests, staff believes that, or staff believes that not all statutory conditions have been satisfied to warrant grant of a mandatory waiver. The foundation of the existing <coughs> transmission tower, number 425-174-425-175, has a footprint of 25 square feet. While the proposed replacement tower will occupy a footprint of 48 square feet. Additionally, the company states that the, the diameters of the foundations of 12 existing towers will be reinforced and, and increased by 12 inches each. The increased diameters of these proposed structures constitute larger structures which will in turn accommodate the larger conductors that will replace the current conductors in this section of the transmission line. Staff has consulted with PPRP, and PPRP agrees that the nature of the proposed work disqualifies this project from the mandatory waiver provision. PUA Section 7-207B3II gives the Commission discretion to waive the CPCN requirement for construction of an overhead transmission line designed to carry in excess of 69 kV in cases where construction is related to an existing overhead transmission line and the Commission finds good cause. This permissive waiver section should only be used when the project would not otherwise fall within the mandatory waiver provision described in PUA Section 7-207B4I. Staff believes that should the transmission grant Transforce Maryland a CPCN for the IEC project, that BGE should be granted a good cause waiver for its portion of the PJM RTEP Project 9A. Staff recommends that the Commission deny the requested mandatory waiver filed under PUA Section 7-207B4I and grant a waiver of the requirement to obtain a CPCN for this project pursuant to PUA Section 7-207B3II for good cause that would take effect only if both this commission and the Pennsylvania Public Utilities Commission approved the IEC project in case number 9471 in Maryland and docket number A-207-2587821 in Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gregor. Council for Office of People's Council. Just want you to understand how special this is unless the commissioners or you have questions, <coughs> I rest on my comments. Uh, that's rare, Mr. Alexander, but appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> Council for um, PPRP. Good morning, commissioners. Um, the power plant research program, as we state in our letter filed July 26, um, support the, the position set forth by the Public Service Commission staff and uh, we also have with us today Fred Kelly from the power plant research program if you have any questions for us thank you not as quick as mr. Alexander but brief <laughs> council for the, the utility good morning mr. chairman members of the Commission uh, David Ralph on behalf of Baltimore gas and electric uh, I would first like to uh, thank uh, Commission staff for their thorough thorough analysis um, as you know we have submitted this as an a mandatory uh, waiver application uh, in rejecting the uh, mandatory waiver uh, staff made I think a couple assumptions that we think are not opposite to the the project that's before you um, and the, the, the first one was uh, staff's concern about the H structure that's being replaced uh, and that the current foundation for that structure is 25 square feet and that the replacement foundation will be 48 square feet uh, I think it's important first to understand uh, what the H that the H structure that's being replaced this one structure uh, 425174 425175 uh, 
the actual uh, steel structure is not increasing in size at all. It's the same, um, you know, dimensions as the one that it's replacing. Uh, staff's concern is that when it's replaced, the, the uh, foundation for the new structure will be larger uh, by a few inches, each of the footers. Just to be clear, you're, you're describing or defining the structure as the tower and Steph appears to be defining the foundation as the structure and the tower. Well, so if you'd like to elaborate on sure, that. Sure, I, I will. I, I think that's an interesting um, legal question, but I don't think it's one that we have to reach today. And the reason is, uh, the reason for the replacement of the H structure uh, is because of its proximity to a 500 kV line. So it's being removed for that purpose. When you remove the structure, the, the H structure out uh, as many feet as we're moving it to avoid its proximity to the 500 kV line, that puts, it will obviously cause tension with the, even the current um, wire that's there. That additional tension will put additional stress load on the structure itself. Um, so the, and, and, and I think it's important to point out that the, the current um, H structure that's, that's there also has some foundational degradation. Uh, so that, that's going to be, that would have to, uh, you know, the foundation would have to be worked on as well. So the replacement of it and the foundation that accommodates that is for the additional tension that will be placed on that structure, the, the additional stress load that's placed on the structure, not because of the larger conductor, which is a slightly larger conductor. It's, it's not um, connected to that. In addition, uh, staff's concern about the 12 modifications that we're doing to 12 structures uh, on this line, um, that the foundation of those, the footers of those structures will be increased by a uh, few inches. Um, it's important to note that we are replacing those foundational structures, or doing these modifications, rather, to the foundational structures because we have seen cracking and, um, and foundational degradation. Uh, so that work would have to be done regardless of whether we were reconductoring this line or not. Um, that is simply reinforcing uh, that because of the fact that we have seen cracking and, uh, and you know, foundational degradation. Um, and so that's why that work is going to be done and has nothing to do with the size of the conductor at all. Um, because those two structures and the placement of them, the foundation that's related to them, uh, really are unrelated to the larger conductor, uh, BGE believes that it falls directly within the ambit of the mandatory waiver. We certainly, um, you know, appreciate uh, a good cause waiver. There is some concern about the um, conditional aspect of that good cause waiver as well. And the fact that it's being tied not only to what happens in Maryland, but what happens in Pennsylvania. Um, and we believe that this commission should be looking at this Maryland project for um, its Maryland aspects and how it affects rate payers here. Thank you. The, the chair will yield to uh, Commissioner Herman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Mr. Roth. Uh, so I just want to um, ask you a couple questions about what you just said. Um, you're saying that uh, you're, you're all right, first of all, are you, do you need to move the one tower with the expanding uh, foundations whether or not Transource is built? Does that tower need to be moved? It does. Okay. And you're also saying that the 12-inch footers being replaced because they're cracked and, and so on and so forth, that also needs to be done? That is correct. Right. And how much does those two portions of this project cost? 
I, I don't know that we have that information. Would it be significantly less than $60 million? We can, we can guess that, of course, it will be less than. Significantly 60. less than $60 million. Okay. And is that something that you could uh, do absent a CPCN with your, uh, for just maintenance, for just those two things? Is that, is that something that can be done without obtaining a CPCN? in your legal opinion uh, for, you know, under your having to do maintenance on your lines and make sure they're safe? Well, again, uh, in terms of the structural integrity of it, yes, I think when, you, when, you, when you're talking about maintenance, yes, that's something that we do um, and we will do. But as defined by um, uh, Staff's Council, I believe it would still be construction uh, that would need to be uh, potentially, but you'd also, of by. course, you'd also have to have all of your state permits and and all of that for any kind of any any work that you would have to do that requires right. permitting. You know, you'd have to get permitting for. It. Okay, so um, did I hear you say that BGE would be um, would agree with staff if staff had suggested that the uh, condition be tied only to the Maryland approval of the line? Uh, we would, we certainly would um, appreciate a waiver of any kind because uh, we do believe this is an important project. Uh, in terms of its connection to the Maryland portion, I wouldn't say we would agree, but certainly we would accept that uh, because it would present less issues for the project that we've presented. Okay. So, uh, absent the uh, the moving of the tower because of its proximity to the 500 kV line and the fixing of the foundation. Is the rest of this project required absent uh, Transource's Project 9A? Yes, so there's, there are several reasons why we would do that and I have uh, folks here that could talk more about uh, that aspect of it. Uh, my understanding is yes, that we would still need to do this, whether it's 9A or I know there's, this bit, there's been discussions about alternatives that would um, necess necessitate utilizing BGE's uh, existing infrastructure. Uh, these repairs would need to be made. Well, uh, so are you saying that you would need them, uh, whether it's 9A or alternative 3, 3A under Transource. Those, you know, if either of those projects were built, that this needs to be done. I, I think this work needs to be done regardless of the IEC um, project. Uh, certainly, it and, would. It would. Okay, so you said you had somebody to explain why that is. Yes. You have somebody here who could explain that. Unfortunately, the person who would be best to do that is not here, and that would be a planner. Um, hmm. But my understanding from talking to them is that this project still needs to be done uh, because it's been ordered by PJM to address the congestion issue in some mass, in some facet. Commissioner right. Herman, if I could just in interrupt, Let, let's just just be clear, Ms. Mr. Ralph, are you or are you not saying that this project needs to be? built at the direction of PGM, regardless of whether or not Transource is approved or constructed by Maryland and Pennsylvania commissions? Yeah. I, I don't have the uh, answer to that. I don't know for sure. Okay. Hmm. I'm not sure I would be comfortable making a decision without that, that fact today. Um, yeah, that, that's, you know, that predicates, a, a, you know, that, that, that's a very important question. Um, uh, so let me just run through a couple of questions. I think sure. you've already answered them, and I'm going to run through them anyway. Uh, is BGE aware that Pennsylvania has not issued an order in for Transource? Excuse me? Is BGE aware that Pennsylvania has not issued an order approving the Transource project? No, we, we, we are not. You believe they have? No. What I have, what my understanding is, is that there's been... Um, discussions in that case regarding the Transource project. Right, I don't no, know There's where no order yet. That's correct. Okay. And there's also aware. no order in Maryland yet. That is correct. Right. And are you aware that uh, there are negotiations underway in Maryland with the parties with respect to Transource? Yes. You're aware of that? We are aware of that. Okay. Um, 
are an, and obviously you are aware that Transource has said it would build alternative 3A if it were ordered to do so, because you mentioned 3A. That yeah. is my understanding. Okay. And it's your position that if 3A is built instead, you still need to make these changes. That is correct. Right, but we don't have anybody here to explain to us why that is the case. I think I'm misunderstanding. You're saying with regard to 3A, why it's still necessary for mm -hmm. 3A? Because the the work that we're doing um, is necessary whether, the purpose of the work is to address the, the uh, congestion issues. That work will have to be done whether you're talking about a, the 9A option because um, or the 3A options because they will all go through the Connerstone substation. So that's that's why that work okay. will have to be done. Okay, thank you. Um, are you able under PJM rules to petition PJM for a delay due to regulatory uncertainty associated with these projects? We are. Okay, have you done so? Uh, no, because again, I, I think um, it's our understanding that um, it's important that this work be done now for other reasons. But you can't tell me what those reasons are. Well, I, again, I, I told you that there are some issues with uh, the way the uh, structures are located now, uh, as well as uh, the foundational issues. There's also my understanding, and I apologize for not um, being versed, versed in this, or fully versed in this, but there's also my understanding that um, it's necessary to address the congestion issue. Mm -hmm. And that the timing of this and scheduling with BJM is crit critically important in terms of outages and so forth. Is it, I, you know, I, I guess I'm just, I'm having a really hard time with this because um, we don't have any information that shows that this project is 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 needed right now. Uh, with the you know taking out the moving the tower to get it away from the 500 kV and fixing foundations yes. so that things are structurally sound, um, I'm just having a really hard time trying to understand um, why it is we need to why it is BG is coming in for this waiver for the full 60 million dollar project as opposed to the structural issues and that sort of thing you know, why you're coming in now without a better explanation as to whether or not, you know, the remainder of all of this work that has to be done is tied to 9A or 3A, uh, neither of which have been approved by Pennsylvania or Maryland. Okay. Could you just give me one moment, please? Sure. I have here with me uh, Al Alford, who's one of the project managers, and I think he can better address your question. Mr. Alford? Yes. Thank you. This project is associated with the, the, the PJM 9A market efficiency project, okay? This is only one segment of the comprehensive line rebuild associated with the 9A. Right. Um, from a timing perspective, we were looking to get this thing started by the fall of 2019 and able to meet a very detailed construction sequencing and outage planning effort that has been coordinated very closely with PJM at this point in time. Not only for the 9A projects, but other work that's taking place on the transmission system at the interface, you know, our interconnection, uh, uh, interconnection points on the northern part of our service territory. Okay, and, and with respect to that uh, sequencing and, and planning, is that, um, when when was that sequencing and planning, uh, on what is that based? Is that based on, on uh, a plan from several years ago with respect to uh, Transource going into service, or is that based on a, a more recent uh, 
planning outlook based on the status it, it of was the based on event. work that some very detailed you know planning uh, that was done and presented to PJM I believe it was in Q1 of 2019 Q1 uh, of that, yes okay. sometime this spring we had meetings with PJM face-to-face uh, -face meetings after multiple conference calls and went through all the detailed sequencing that was going to take place on the transmission system and was that associated with a timeline that uh, Transource was going or the IEC project was going to be installed uh, by a date we were in really particular? focused on, at, you know, from a BG&E perspective, we were focused on all the projects that we had to construct on, you know, BG&E, you know, transmission system, not anything that Transsource was doing uh, on their side of the interconnection points. I understand, from, from and, and I fully appreciate that that's the BGE <coughs> focus because it's, you know, the BGE system. We need to submit outages, you know, to through the through the process to PJM for clearances, you know, uh, many months, sometimes over a year in advance to meet these durations. Mm -hmm. So there's advanced planning from a timing perspective. It's you tr you try to lay out your your schedule, you know, to to have some level of float in there if you know you you get weather events or something like that. Mm -hmm. But spring and the fall are the typical times where we're going to be able to get the clearances to be able to perform the, I'm going to call it the, uh, the hands-on work, not you know, so much foundation work. Or <clears throat> and is the, uh, is the work that BGE is planning to do initially to move the tower, the H, the H structure away from the 500 kV and then uh, doing the uh, foundational work is that sort of the first phase or is that come later in this project there's quite a few uh, elements um, that would need to be sequenced in the detailed um, construction schedule there's going to be multiple crews working doing different types of tasks you know maybe associated with the H frame uh, you know, stuff that we can do you know when we don't require clearance you know outages um, with the foundation you know upgrades and things like this that would happen um, right right away some lattice tower upgrades things of that when you need to get into you know when you're specifically working on that structure that level of sequencing is is, is in a planning state I don't have the details you know construction schedule in front of me mm -hmm. just going by experience okay uh, thank you mr. chairman thank you I have a question. Yeah, please. Did PJM, did, did their board approve this project? I know we have a, a letter of constructability signed. Um, I'm, I'm in project management through our transmission planning. You know, it, it goes through them. I would assume that the board approved it if, if there's a con letter of constructability signed and you know, that, that really gets issued by PJM. So is this considered a supplemental project under the RTO planning process? I can, cannot answer that question. I mean, it's a PJM market efficiency project first. But, well, the Transource is a market efficiency. This project is not part of that market efficiency upgrade, is it? It is part of the 9A project. Well, what if 9A from, doesn't get approved? What is it? By Maryland or by, or by, by either, either one of us, Pennsylvania, Commonwealth, of Pennsylvania, or State of Maryland, either one. What is it then? Then we wouldn't perform the construction on the project. So monies. Then what happens to the monies that are spent? Do the ratepayers eat that? Eat those monies like they did in PATH and and uh, other yeah. transmission projects that were canceled? Yeah, my my understanding is, you're saying in terms of the entire in, uh, construction or just the uh, the upgrades to the Conestone. I'm saying if, the, if those large market efficiency projects are not approved by anybody and they don't go forward, these projects are not needed, this project is not needed. And if that's the case, who eats the money that is spent on this? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say this project isn't needed. I understand in terms of long-term planning, it will ultimately be needed to address the market efficiency issues whether it's through this design or some other design. 
Uh, yeah, it's I don't know. We're going around the rose bush here on this. Uh, if 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 these are not approved by PJM, and the market efficiency big projects aren't approved for some reason. My question is, why do you need this project now? Why do you need this waiver now? That's why they mandated us to build a project. Oh, could you repeat your question, no, Commissioner? I, 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 I think I, it was approved by PJMI, so I'm. That's why I'm having a little difficulty. So, uh, so if we talk to PJM, they'll say this is a supplemental project, and we don't approve these supplemental projects. As a transmission owner. And we've, we've been down this path many times with them. So, you, But you're sitting here telling me on archived video that PJM has approved this project. And I, I don't know that that's how the planning process works. My understanding of the planning process is that they don't approve supplemental projects. I don't know that this is a supplement. I don't think this is a supplement. I think that's what the testimony so it's, is. So you're telling me it's part of the Transource project? Yes, so it's part of the RTEP. It is part of the RTEP. And so what I'm saying, but I, I, I think uh, we're having. RTEP and Transource Project are two different things. So okay. you're, you're interchanging terminology here. It is, it is part of the PJM 9A project. It is. What happens if those projects don't get approved? If it gets, and you're talking about in any fashion. If we don't issue an order that approves that yes or Pennsylvania does it. right so either in its 3a form or that's any correct. other form that's so what I'm saying to you is in terms of long-term planning this project would still have benefits in long term long term but it's not necessary now right not needed if it's part of that project and that part project hasn't been approved yes, I mean in other words this project submittal before us right now is really is contingent upon the approval of that bigger project. I, I think I understand what you're saying. So, yes, in terms of timing, you're, you're correct. All right. Thank you. Mr. Um, Ralph and Mr. Alford, I, I'm uh, struggling here. I'm sympathetic to the, the basic argument, and I'm not terribly sympathetic to our staff's argument regarding the structures. I, I don't think the foundation is part of the structure, so we'll put that to the side. But, Mr. Alford, I, I just heard from you that if the commissions, Pennsylvania and Maryland, don't approve Transource, bg &E would not build this project. Is that what you said? Yeah, um, immediately, yes. I mean, there are parts of the project that were explained with the foundations and degradation and things like this that would need to be. Maintenance that, needs to be taken yeah, care of. That's but, correct. But, but the project before us, the, this line, um, it's your position that bg e notwithstanding the commencement date of tomorrow, August 2019, for modification of overhead transmission structures and foundations, um, we, it, in terms of the schedule, we have moved that schedule back. Oh, the schedule we have is no longer up yeah, to date. I think okay. we've uh, since had to move it back because of the scheduling of this here. I... I'm not clear at all, and um, my confidence is a little bit shaken because we, we have a number of assumptions that were laid before the commission, whether that this is an approved RTEP project, whether it's a supplemental project. I think we could all agree that this is a component of Transource. But is PGM directing bg &E to reconductor this line regardless of whether Maryland or Pennsylvania approved Transource. That's my only question. And the exact question of that, I, I guess, give me a moment to, to uh, see if I can answer that question. Sorry, uh, 
Commission, Commissioner Stanek, if you could repeat your question, please. My question is whether PGM has directed your utility to build and reconductor the project before us, regardless of whether or not TransSource is constructed. No. My understanding is it's, it's part of the um, PGM 9A project. And it would not be constructed absent approval by Maryland and Pennsylvania. My understanding is the basis of the, the order is because of that. Yes. Okay. So, so, so if that's the case, why does not BG&E just say we agree with staff's recommendation, the good cause with the conditions? Because you're, you're admitting right now, as Mr. Alford admitted a minute ago, that you're not going to build this project absent approval from the commissions. So we'll give you the good cause waiver. We'll, we'll is that what you're, <laughs> you're willing to take what's behind door number two? It will take what's behind door number two. Uh, I, I guess my only concern was staff's uh, description of what we were doing at the site, which really falls within uh, the mantle. But we'll, for, we'll for me, that's a technicality, what staff's doing with it, the, the inches and, and the structure mm -hmm. and the foundation. Right. My, my concern is, is whether or not this is going to be green-lighted, absent approvals from the commission and... I think that today's discussion has been unnecessarily complicated, but if the utility is willing to submit to the conditions of the three state agencies and um, not develop this project absent um, twin approvals, we could leave it there. Um, Commissioner Richard. I, I think most of the questions have been asked, but uh, I did want to just check in with uh, C our PPRP. Um, are you do I understand it correctly that you fully support the staff position I, I just when I read your letter um, it looked like the last sentence you you may be requesting an additional uh, condition in this order is, is that correct or it does the staff uh, position suffice yes Commissioner um, Richard we do fully support the staff however in the future okay. if they rebuild significantly this line we would like it because it is 25 miles we would like to be able to provide conditions at that time because this line does not have a CPC and I don't believe either okay currently and what was described today um, if, if the, if the uh, company does want to proceed with uh, moving the tower and uh, and also you know addressing the cracks in the base is, is, is that something that falls outside of, of a PPRP I, I guess the scope of the project that would require the uh, type of uh, CPC and that you'd be seeking you mean at this time, if yeah. they go forward, as they, uh, we would agree with the staff at this time. I'm not talking discretionary about what was described as just the maintenance type uh, issues. You mean if they don't get the discretionary waiver and they move forward with the? Would, would that also fall under what you would describe in the, the last sentence? Also, something that would require a, a CPCN in your view. I'll let Mr. Kelly um, respond. Yeah, good morning, Fred Kelly with Power Plant Research Program. I think the point of that last um, element in our letter uh, advising on a condition is that if the project goes forward, it seems like the, uh, the action is somewhat de minimis, uh, okay. you know, one tower. Uh, but we can conceive that when you put in that larger circuit, uh, maybe these uh, towers would uh, maybe approach end of life somewhere if they're at a, such a time that they come back and do significant work to reconstruct the line, the circuit's already in place, they may apply for another waiver of some context, understanding that this line doesn't have a CPCN, PPRP would be interested in revisiting that if uh, if there's a much bigger project that comes forward across that 25 mile long uh, mm -hmm. expanse. Uh, you know, if they're moving towers, reconstructing in different areas, we would be interested at that time. Okay, great, thank you. Can I can I follow up on that because I'm a little confused right now based on what Miss McElmore said. Let me make sure I understand. How would you, if there's no CPCN, how would PPRP enter the conditions? Under what vehicle would you would you put those additional conditions in the future on? From my understanding, at this point, if it goes forward under a discretionary waiver, uh, we would be able to attach a condition to that, um, much as the uh, contingency with respect to the uh, 9A project decision. I, I, so assume arguendo that the commission is getting ready to um, deny the mandatory waiver and approve a conditional waiver based on the approval of the transource uh, projects in both states. If we do that, how do you come back later and attach 
attached conditions to this project. Can someone clarify that? I think we would expeditiously put that in front of you. That was probably neglectful on our part to not include uh, a conditional language in our letter or filing. But uh, PPRP is not accustomed to responding on mandatory waivers because they are pretty much black and white. And it's, we always rely on the right. commission's um, you know, understanding on that. But in this case here, it, it seems the description of the project, there was some gray area in terms of what constituted larger structures. I, I, I get that. I'm just thinking of what will be the vehicle, the application. There'll be no application to PPRP, so there'll be no chance to attach anything to it. Commissioner O'Donnell, at this time, we do not want to put further conditions on this discretionary waiver. We are discussing in the future if they come back and want another dis um, mandatory waiver because they're doing something to the lines because it's so long and it's going to be a larger m more construction okay, in that so, so they would have to time. reapply a separate in the case future. separate filing you're saying under yes, separate sure. filing separate guys not this particular not this item particular we're the only condition we would want to put at this time if you would like us to is is something saying that in the future if they have to replace all the poles no, at the time no. that type of thing we do not want to do <laughs> that but that yeah. right let's let's th this has become way too complicated wow. we pr pprp probably should not have even included that if they have a different project that's when pprp comes in um sorry to interrupt that's right. thank you um I'm prepared to offer a motion. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, did you email Commissioner McDonald? Actually, would you mind if I take the motion because he has some additional information or some more oh. inaccuracies? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Richard, why, why don't you make make the motion? Let's do it by the numbers. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, I'm at. Okay. For item number nine, I move we deny the requested mandatory waiver filed under PUA. 7-207B4I and grant a waiver of the requirement to obtain a CPCN for this project pursuant to PUA 7-207B3II for good cause <coughs> that would take effect only if both the Commission and Pennsylvania Public Utility Commissions approve the IEC project in case number 9471 in Maryland and docket number a-2017-25878 for Transource Pennsylvania Applications LLC A2017-2640195 and A2017-26402 in Pennsylvania. All in favor? Any opposed? <laughs> the modified motion is approved. Thank you. Thank you. We will uh, go ahead and uh, strike item number 13 from the agenda. Mr. Secretary. Mr. Chairman, uh, we're going to call items 10, 11, and 12 collectively together. Uh, Item uh, 10 is the Potomac Edison Company filed a request for a temporary waiver of Comar 2050-09-04 D&E. The same also for Potomac Electric Power Company and Delmarva Power and Lake Company. And finally, the <coughs> same for the Baltimore Gas and Electric Company, which is... Oh, no. Well. Yeah, sorry. Continue. Mr. Collins. Um, I'm sorry. Don't, don't have a seat, though. I'm saying don't have a seat. Just stand by the podium, please. Okay. And finally, for item 12, also Baltimore Gas and Electric filed uh, its request for a waiver of Comar 2050-09-04-D. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Dean. Uh, good morning. Michael Dean on behalf of staff. Uh, these are all requests for waivers of the commission regulations at 20.50.04.D. 1, 2, and 3, and E, um, which were recently revised in rulemaking 67 on October 8, 2018. Uh, during the rulemaking process, the companies indicated that there was a possibility that they may need to request uh, waivers. Uh, these are the small generator interconnection uh, regulations. 
Comar 20.50.04D includes a uh, requirement that each electric company establish a process that allows an applicant for a small generator interconnection to sign and submit the request electronically on the website, track the status of the interconnection electronically, and conduct other processes electronically as may reasonably occur. And 20.50.04E requires that the implementation of the processes occurred no later than J June 30, 2019. The companies have all implemented this for existing, cus existing parties that have current customer uh, accounts with the companies. However, the small generator interconnection process may require uh, the companies to consider applications from parties who do not have current customer account numbers with the company. And as such, the entire process will need to uh, be revised to incorporate that. Uh, the customers excuse me, the electric companies uh, are going to implement, implement an interim manual workaround process for these customers without uh, current account numbers in which uh, the applications will be submitted via a PDF form and statuses will be uh, communicated using uh, email. Uh, staff has reviewed this and believes the customer, the electric companies have made good faith efforts to implement the process, uh, but initially had not anticipated the impacts uh, in the programming for customers without existing account numbers. Uh, as such, uh, staff recommends that the commission grant the electric <coughs> company waiver request for Comar 20.50.09.04D and E until June 30, 2020 for the Potomac Edison Company and to April 30, 2020 for the Delmarva Power and Light Company, Potomac Electric Power Company, and Baltimore Gas and Electric Company. And that includes a correction to the staff comments on that. Right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dean, for those recommendations. Um, do you counsel for any of the utilities uh, wish to argue or contest uh, the narrative laid forth by Mr. Dean? No. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the commissioners? I was just interested um, in the uh, looking at the two filings by staff. Um, in the uh, PHI filing, it talks about F Exelon Corporation uh, creating a, uh, you know, and designing, uh, implementing an online application portal for for the, uh, well, I assume for their companies and, and why BGE and, and that would be done in uh, by the end of 2019, but BGE would not be, you know, online with their portal till 2020. Since it's also an excellent company, is there anything staff could add or that or answer about that, or would that be something for the companies? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, Samra Itdarari with uh, Commission staff. Um, my understanding is they're going to complete the process by the end of uh, this year, but so they would fully implement the, the system uh, by April uh, 30th of uh, next year. Okay. Well, it, it said it was for all the excellent utilities and uh, and that was going to be implemented at the end of 2019 um, so why why the delay for for BG which is also an excellent utility if I might oh, I'm okay. sorry did you no. Go ahead. if I might commissioner um the current estimation is that the all the systems will be up and running by the end of 2019 but as with all things IT related that could slip 
So what we wanted to do is we wanted to go with a date where we we are we we know that it that the system will be implemented for both the PHI companies and for BGE. Because what we don't want to do is have to come back and ask for another waiver if for some reason okay. the 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 programs are not implemented. So the end of the year, mm -hmm. that is the current estimated time, but that is once again just an estimation. Okay, so that brings both companies then in, in, in line. Correct, Your Honor. All three companies. Okay, thank Correct. you. Correct. Thank you. Are there motions? Uh, I, oh, sorry, uh, Commissioner. I just had one Linton. couple of okay. questions uh, for the company. Um, so just to be clear, the company has completed the uh, interconnection online process uh, for customers who have an account number. So you've, all of you have met that requirement in the Coma regulation. Okay. Yes. No, head nods. Okay. Um, so what type of uh, uh, volume of consumers are we talking about uh, for the ones without applications? Is this a significant number or is this a small percentage of total customers who submit applications? Um, Your Honor, speaking just for PHI, I believe we, and, and I'll let my, my, uh, my counterparts speak for their respective companies, but for the PHI companies, we indicated in our filing that based on our 2018 numbers, we are talking about less than 1% yeah. of, of our so it's a very small number. It's small for everybody, right? For Potomac Edison, we're estimating around 5%. Okay. And for BG, I don't have a percentage, but it's less than 100 customers because we're only dealing with situations where it's a level one interconnection and it's somebody that does not have an account number already. So we're talking about new home builders that are putting solar panels on the houses as they're being constructed, for instance. Okay. All right, thank you. Seeing no additional questions, is, is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move the um, for item number 10, the commission grant the company's waiver request from the requirements of COMAR 20.50.09.04 Delta and ECHO until June 30th, 2020 for interconnection inter 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 applicants that do not have an active account number with the company. For item number 11, Move the Commission grant the company's limited waiver request from the requirements of COMAR 20.50.09.04 Delta and ECHO until April 30th, 2020 for interconnection applicants that do not have an active account number with the company. And for item number 12, move the Commission grant the company's limited waiver request requirements of COMAR 20.50.09.04 Delta and ECHO until April 30th, 2020, for level one interconnection applicants that do not have an active account number with the company. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The motions are approved. Thank you. Next item, Mr. Chairman, item number 14 is General One Mid-Atlantic LLC filed a request for an administrative change to the CPCN. It's case number 9229. Good morning again, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Lloyd Spivak for the Commission staff. Gen on Mid-Atlantic LLC filed a written request to the Commission to obtain authorization to amend its 2011 Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity to install a staged turbulent air reactor unit uh, at the company's Morgantown generating station. The requested amendment would modify Condition A-10 in the CPCN to allow shipments of fly ash from several mid-Atlantic generating stations to the Morgantown generating station in order to utilize the excess capacity of the star unit. As matters currently stand under condition A10 of the CPCN, Genon is only per permitted to process fly ash uh, obtained from Morgantown, Chalk Point, and Dickerson plants which uses only about a third of the plant's capacity. Genon proposes to process fly ash from three other coal-fired power plants in the mid-Atlantic region, uh, from which the fly ash output possesses similar characteristics to the fly ash that is currently being processed. Because the change would not increase the air emissions from the facility, it does not fall within the Public Utilities Article definition of a CPCN modification that would require a full CPCN case. However, Comar 26.11.02.02H allows PPRP and MDE to impose additional conditions if the original condition is modified and they have proposed two supplemental conditions in a letter dated July 29th, 2019. Uh, I note uh, that uh, PPRP's filed letter 
is slightly co self-contradictory because on the one hand uh, it does support the staff recommendation to uh, to approve the uh, um, approve the amendment to the CPCN with two supplemental conditions that PPRP lays forth but they also suggest a notice and comment period followed by the possibility of what would seem to be additional um, supplemental conditions uh, so it's not entirely clear uh, which of those uh, which of those uh, recommendations PPRP actually would prefer to happen staff certainly has no objection if the Commission uh, were to decide to go down the route of notice and comment and seeking uh, additional comment from uh, people who might be affected in the immediate vicinity of the plants. Uh, that said, staff recommends that the Commission approve the administrative change to Condition A10 as requested by Genon, subject to the supplemental conditions proposed by PPRP and MDD. Thank you, uh, Mr. Spivak. Uh, Council for Department of Natural Resources. Ms. McElmore, I saw that you might have uh, some rebuttal to Mr. Spivak. No rebuttal, Your Honor. It's just that we didn't realize that that was ambiguous. No, we only have the conditions that are listed in our filing. It would be one revised uh, condition 810 and then also two supplemental conditions that address traffic mitigation. And that would be all that we would be recommending. Also at this time, if you have any questions, I do have Bill Paul with the Maryland Department of Energy and also um, Helen Stewart with DNR if you have any questions about the transportation portion of that. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Spivak, uh, Ms. McElmore included everything on one, one page with her uh, A10 and SUP1 and SUP2. What, what was confusing because I didn't see any contradiction? Uh, it's the last paragraph of the um, letter. Oh, oh, of her, of her letter. Or uh, Mr. Due, uh, due to the high level of public interest expressed okay. during, the original C oh, during the original CPC application, we recommend that the Public Service Commission establish a public comment period to allow for interested stakeholders to provide input on Genon's request to change and the state agency's recommended response. Okay. I, I, I see what you're saying now. Um, although we've had this filing publicly docketed since May 31st, so there, there has been time for comment and, and notice. Uh, Office of People's Council, Mr. Alexander. Thank you, Your Honor. We didn't uh, file comments, so this will be brief, really, really brief. Um, this was one of the first cases that I had when I joined the OPC. It's so long ago, it was 2007, I believe, that I had forgotten all about it. So I'm only going to mention two things. One, I learned that fly ash was used in making concrete. And that's why it has value. Uh, the other one is, is that it was very controversial about the amount of traffic that a lot of uh, landowners, house owners, um, felt the going to and from the, the, there would be a lot of trucks going, going back and forth. And so that was a big issue in the original filing in 2007. It was all worked out, but I just wanted to bring that to the Commission's attention, and I'm out of here. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Have a nice day. Um, Council for uh, Genon Mid-Atlantic, LLC. Good morning, Chairman and Commissioners. Diana Crever of Venable for Council for Genon Mid-Atlantic. And with me, I have David Kramer, the Environmental Director from Genon as well as Todd Wilson, the Director of Environmental Services for the CEPA Group, which operates the Star Reactor, and they're both available if you have any substantive questions. Um, on the traffic point that Mr. Alexander brought up, um, there was a traffic study, and there's a limitation on the number of trucks, and we're not asking for any change to that limitation on the number of trucks that, that's in the original um, CPCN. And most of that had to do with the fact that they were bringing ash from the Chalk Point facility to Morgantown, and that's a lot of very small roads. So they wanted to make sure that wouldn't impact surrounding neighborhoods. That what we're talking about now with where the ash would be coming from in Virginia and Pennsylvania, that's all major highways. So those same roads between Chalk Point um, and Morgantown, we're not talking about any increased traffic on those roads, and that was really what the community was concerned about at that time. Um, 
And we don't have an objection to PPRP's additional two conditions. Um, we just are not aware of a requirement for an additional public comment period. Um, and we would, we think that the cha because the change requested doesn't involve any physical change to the star, star facility or its operation, no increase in emissions, and it just allows the facility to be more fully utilized within its existing approved operating parameters. Um, we don't think an additional public comment period is warranted here. All right, just to be clear, you, you have no objection to and you would adopt uh, DNR's supplemental one and supplemental two conditions? That's correct. I recognize under your current certificate you could have a maximum of 140 trucks per day. Are these like 18-wheeler trucks? They're in Good morning, if you could identify yourself. Yes, uh, Todd Wilson with the CIFA group. It, uh, basically pneumatic tanker, bolt powder tankers. So 18 wheelers, yes, sir. Oh, tanker, so this is a liquid? No, sir. It's a bolt powder. That's a powder? Yes. Sir. And, a and so it, it's, it's a dry bolt powder that's contained in a pneumatic tanker. So there's no dusting or anything like that. I'm just curious, curious to know. I understand you won't go above your 140 limit, but um, if we approve this certificate uh, amendment, what would the traffic change look like from what to what? Well, right now it's kind of non existent. I mean, we're barely doing 100,000 tons a year. So, what, what is you, that in terms might, of? You might go from 30 trucks a day, 20, 30 trucks a day to maybe 45, 50 trucks. So, at Right now, today's average is 20 to 30 trucks per day at the facility? Yeah, okay. maybe. maybe. On a good day. And when, we when we have ash to sell. Okay. <laughs> and you estimate that with the change importing from out of state, you'll have another 15 trucks delivered? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, do commissioners have questions? Commissioner O'Donnell. Where, where does the company envision that the, its collection area will be? How, how broad are we going to be trucking this stuff in from? Uh, obviously, the closer the sources, the better. The problem that we encounter is the utilities, different utilities in the region. They already have ash marketing contractors, and they have a contract in place. So we are trying to locate utilities that are either not marketing their ash and disposing of it, so that way we can keep it out of the landfill. And so that kind of... It just, you know, it, it broadens the area. It could be within 100 miles or it might be within 200 miles. But the, really the economics kind of kills when you go that far out. And, and when, when you do the process at Chalk Point, what are you actually doing there? We're uh, loading uh, the byproduct ash that they would typically landfill, and we're bringing that to the uh, Morgantown unit where it's processed through the Star facility. Yeah, and, what, and Mike, I, I intended to ask you, what, what are you actually doing at that Star facility? What, what happens there? So it's a thermal beneficiation uh, facility. So what it does is it uh, utilizes the carbon as its heat source. It's a, a, it's a kind of a chemical reaction, exothermic reaction, that not only reduces the carbon, but it also changes surface chemistry and characteristics to make it more suitable for utilize, utilization of ready-mix concrete. And is there any byproduct that comes out of that process? <clears throat> no, sir. As far as solid waste uh, related to processing ash, it does have a blue gas desulfurization unit on it, and that's all tied in with the utility, but there is no by byproduct solid waste on that facility. Okay. And So there is some emissions, and that's controlled by... Yeah. That's uh, controlled Department by the FPD scrubber, and they have a uh, Genon has a full blown uh, Noxio SO2 SIM monitoring emissions. I don't know if staff knows or if PPRP knows. In the last two to three years since I've been on the commission, we did something with the CPCN, some modification or something to accommodate Chalk Point Dickerson movement. Any, can anybody remind me what that was? I, I, I can if uh, anyone else didn't have uh, uh, I, I am drawing a blank, Commissioner. <laughs> uh, I'm Bill Paul. I'm with the Maryland Department of the Environment. Uh, there's been a lot of activity going on 
with the, the uh, power plants over the years, but I don't know specifically what you may be referring to. There was a filing before the commission in the last two to three years since I've been here. I know I sat on this bench and heard it. I'll find that out outside of here if nobody knows. Can you help me? Yeah, it's David Kramer with Genon. In 2017, we did approach you uh, for uh, to request uh, adding uh, the Dickerson station as a source for gypsum. We wanted to transport our gypsum to our gypsum loadout facility, which is also located at Morgantown. Okay. So that was, yeah, as recently. I, I do recall that now, and this won't have anything to do with bringing in uh, additional gypsum. Uh, correct. This is uh, talking about the fly ash product in the star unit. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Any additional questions? Seeing none, is there a motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I move that we approve the administrative change to condition A 10 as requested by the company, subject to the conditions stated by the Power Plant Research Program and Maryland Department of the Environment in their July 29, 2019 filing. Thank you. All in favor? Any opposed to the motion is approved. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Also, Commissioner, I would like to request that if, if the Commission is okay with this, if PPRP would be able to provide an updated revised conditions, a full set of them, so that the, the federal air permit can um, refer back to the full set. And we could provide that in the docket. Right. As long as there's no, no changes, we're just adding the two. Exactly. That's, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Secretary. Next item, Mr. Chairman, item number 15 is Chop Tank Electric Cooperative Inc. filed a letter seeking authorization to retroactively bill a customer pursuant to Comar 2050.04.05. Mr. Dean. Michael Dean, again on behalf of staff. Item 15 is a request by Chop Tank Electric Cooperative to retroactively bill customer Nyler Mill Village for a 24 month period between July 2014 and June 2016 in the amount of $3,109, an amount which the customer has already paid. Customer regulations or commission regulations at Comar 20.50.04.05D2 allow an electric company to retroactively bill a customer for any undercharges in the prior 12 month period period without commission approval and with commission approval to retroactively bill for the period prior to 12 months uh, up to three years prior to the discovery of the error if the customer knew or reasonably should have known that the bills were in error. The electric company re uh, request must explain the factual basis and provide the customer with notice of its right to notify the commission if it is in opposition to the request. As discussed in the cooperative's filings and in the staff comments, Chop Tank discovered it had not been billing the Nyler Mill Village for its security lighting, an error which was apparently discovered after a report was made that one of the lights was malfunctioning in May 2017. Chop Tank filed its request retroactively bill Nyler Mill Village for the 24 month period between June 2014 and June, excuse me, July 2014 and June 2016, which represents the period between one and three years prior to the building period. Uh, and in a subsequent filing, corrected the amount retroactively billed to reflect the approved rates in effect at the time. The cooperative in June 20, 2018 informed staff that the customer had received or that the cooperative had received payment from the customer for the uh, full amount and staff, as discussed in its comments, verified that the customer was aware of its rights to contest the billing and of the fact that the commission had not yet ruled on the cooperative's request for a retroactive billing authority. Staff, as noted in its comments, has reviewed the matter and concluded that the customer should have known that it had not been billed for the lighting and determined that the cooperative's request should be granted. Staff recommends that the commission provide retroactive authority to Chop Tank to impose a bill of $3,109 on the Nyler Mill Village for electricity service that was provided during the period from July 2014 through June 2016. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Is the customer here today seeing none? Uh, counsel for Chop Tank, uh, 
Do you have anything to add? Uh, Tiffany Troutman for Chop Tank Electric, uh, manager, not counsel. I do not have anything to add, but any questions you may have, I'm here to answer. Thank you. Any questions from the commissioners? Commissioner Linton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one, maybe it's a clarification question for staff. Uh, on a page of four of your comments, you say that uh, uh, the customer paid the bill on uh, July 14th, 2017, and on July 20th of the same year is when ChopTech first filed its request for authorization to bill retroactively. It, uh, that timing accurate? So in other words, the customer uh, had already received a request to pay from Chop Tank and had in fact paid the bill, and then the filing to request the authorization to bill was submitted to the Commission. And I, I can answer that question. Sure. The member made the payment once we filed additional documents with the Commission we just notified the member that we were filing these additional documents and that these copies were being mailed to the member because they were being filed with the commission. And after the member received that letter, they then forwarded payment on to us. The cooperative did not request payment at that time. We were just following Comar that we needed to let the member know that that was being filed at the commission. Okay. I thank you. I just wanted to make it make clear that the company wasn't attempting to uh, collect the debt before having permission to do so. So no, we were okay. not. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, additional questions? Seeing none, is there a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I move we grant the company retroactive authority to impose a bill of three thousand one hundred nine dollars on Naylor Mill Village for electricity services provided by Chop Tank during the period from July 2014 through June 2016. All in favor? Aye. The motion is approved. This commission will stand in recess until 12:10.
Mr. Secretary, the next item, please. All right, the uh, last item on the agenda, item number 16, is Southern Maryland Electric Cooperative filed its application for public electric vehicle charging station pilot program. It's case number 9478. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Annette Garofalo on behalf of the Commission staff, and with me is my colleague Drew McAuliffe of the Commission's Electricity Division. Uh, item 16 is an application by SMECO for authority to construct, own, and operate up to 60 public electric vehicle charging stations over a five-year period uh, in accordance with Commission Order Number 88997, which set various parameters regarding certain utility requests regarding proposed electric vehicle portfolio implementation. Staff recommends that the Commission direct SMECO to refile its proposal for the public electric vehicle charging station tariff including charging rates as directed in, in its order 88997 and request comments by all interested parties on the proposal and tariff within 60 days after filing of the tariff. Staff's recommendation is made to give all parties, including SMECO's customer owners, an opportunity to comment on the cooperative's proposal once a tariff has been filed in compliance with the Commission's electric vehicle order. Comments may be filed regarding the proposed uh, scope of SMECO's EV proposal, such as the lack of a residential proposal, the rates to be charged, the number of chargers, and the program's cost and method of cost recovery. This will ensure that all aspects of SMECO's proposal have been thoroughly vetted by the various stakeholders and entities with knowledge of EV programs. With regard to the merits of SMECO's current filing, staff notes that the Commission's EV order and subsequent tariff approvals have required a tariff establishing an EV charging station class for the assignment of all capital and fixed costs, contrary to SMECO's proposed allocation of those costs in its filing. Staff recommends that the Commission set an upper limit of 20 DCF chargers, similar to the limit set for the Potomac Edison Company, which is in the same size range, rather than the flexibility requested by SMECO. Staff further recommends that SMECO be required to include in its tariff a fixed rate to be charged throughout its service territory. Finally, staff recommends that should a, a SMECO's program and tariff be approved, ultimately the SMECO work co cooperatively with the utilities operating EV portfolios in ways that may reduce costs and increase the efficiencies. Thank you, Ms. Garofalo. At this point, the commission is, uh, the intent is to, to rule from the bench today. So if we uh, fail to recognize any of the recommendations of staff, please let me know. Um, Council for Office of People's Council. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Mikhail Raker on behalf of the Office of People's Council. We have very um, brief comments, three, I think, generally two noted in our letter. We support staff's recommendations for the commission to direct SMECO to refile its application mm -hmm. with the applicable tariffs, um, and that would pr provide stakeholders an, an opportunity to comment on both then. Um, again, should the commission approve SMECO's application, we would ask that the um, commission specifically di direct SMECO to abide by all the requirements and directives in order number 88997. Um, as related to the public EV charging stations. And then one additional point, um, should the Commission approve SMECO's application, we, we also support staff's recommendation of a maximum of 20 DCFC chargers. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Council for SMECO. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Mark McDougall on behalf of uh, SMECO. Um, <clears throat> SMECO filed its uh, proposal of, to have public facing charging stations. Uh, in the middle of May of this year. Uh, at that time, we did not, we, we had not put together uh, our proposed tariff sheets, uh, and of course, we had not put together a marketing plan. Uh, we are here today uh, seeking approval of our plan. Uh, we can commit to the Commission that we will file tariff sheets um, post haste, uh, and when I say that, I say within a week. Um, uh, that would that uh, would be uh, market that would reflect market-based rates, just as uh, the uh, Exxon utilities had filed. Uh, we um, we don't believe that it would be uh, advisable uh, to um, to defer Smeco's plan and send it to the EV working group at this point in time, 
SMECO modeled its plan after that which the Commission had approved for the investor-owned utilities, and those plans had been vetted through the EV working group uh, quite extensively. So we believe that um, that uh, uh, that pushing the plan to the EV working group at this time for discussion would unduly delay uh, the um, the implementation of public facing uh, public e facing um, uh, charging stations in Southern Maryland uh, because the issues that that um, existed for the investor and utilities should not uh, exist for SMECO since we modeled it after uh, the Commission's order. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Jeff Shaw, who you all know. Uh, Mr. Shaw is in charge of, uh, of implementing our electric vehicle charging station program, and he has a few comments. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, Mr. McDougall must have looked at my script here and taken a few of my words, so I'll be even more brief. Um, we recognize we're a little delayed. We're behind the other utilities. We're playing some catch up. Um, as far as the residential and the multifamily space, we have some challenges on the time of use fronts with some billing system upgrades we're ongoing. So we've talked to you before through Empower about this. We hope and expect to have time of use ready for us in late 2020, early 2021 is what we're hoping for there. Um, as far as the flexibility around the uh, level two and the, the DC fast, we could agree to the, the cap of 20. Um, there would be no budget increase that we'd be seeking as a result of that. We keep the budgets the same, just reducing the number of level two chargers in that space at that time. Um, We've watched with great intent the hearings from the other utilities. So we have begun attending the ZVIC, as they're calling themselves now, the ZVIC meetings, and well aware of the MarylandEV.org piece that we will be incorporating with our website once we are, are given permission to do so. We've been contacted by all the county governments, a lot of local towns. Um, there's a lot of buzz around this. In the, uh, in the space, so we'll work with them through the application process and make sure we uh, ensure geographic diversity across the service territory. As you saw in our filing, the infrastructure currently in our service territory is quite limited, and there are only two DC fast charging stations that we're aware of, so we really need to build out that infrastructure for us. Um, and looking down here, uh, Mr. McDougall addressed my other comments, so I'll just end there and take any questions. Thank you. Your, um, Your Honor, just yes. a, a point of clarification. Staff did not recommend that the this go back to the working group. It, it, only a comment period. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I am impressed with uh, the proposal that, that SMECO uh, has provided us with. Um, as you noted, particularly our rural regions uh, don't have the, the capacity uh, on the roads currently. So if I wanted to, to go down to Scotland or Solomon's Island or to visit Commissioner O'Donnell in, in Lusby, uh, I might be, uh, uh, I don't know what the equivalent of saying <laughs> running on fumes, but uh, <laughs> yes, I'd be stuck. Um, I'd be stuck wait, wait, wait. in Lusby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we intend to remedy that. <laughs> well, I, and your program, in terms of numbers of chargers and number the uh, cost to um, to ratepayers, is almost identical, close to the dollar, as what uh, Potomac Edison is is looking at. I appreciate you're taking the consideration of OPC and uh, staff into account of uh, having a sort of a one ter third, two thirds approach with a cap of 20 DC fast chargers. I, I recognize that you probably couldn't go much above 20 and still stay within your three point $2 million dollar um, budget for for staff um, why should the Commission not approve the the program as presented today recognizing as the utility understands they'll have to file tariff sheets at some later date that's how we treated the other IOUs that were before us um, and then we could rule on uh, pricing whether it be fixed or or uh, non-uniform across the service territory. I think Commissioner Herman made some remarks last time whether sh we should have one unified KWH charge um, or should the utility be allowed to 
have a variable market-based rate depending on where the, the charger is, is located. So perhaps to my first question, wh why should we not approve the proposal today? Uh, SMECO, uh, while they did participate in the working group, uh, they did not participate in the case. Uh, and they are, do have a different structure uh, than the IOUs. And our thinking was that there should be a notice period um, that's formal uh, in order f to receive comments. It, it is possible you won't receive any comments, but, but uh, in opening I mentioned things that you might receive comments on. Although the, the, the notice period, um, I, th I think party, parties are notice, at least regarding today's um, administrative meeting, you believe that the notice period paired with actual tariff sheets would, would better inform those other parties that are not here today? Uh, they, they would. One of the things that's missing by virtue of n no tariff is that uh, uh, the, set, the setup of a uh, separate EV uh, charging class is, is, is missing. Right. And in, in the other cases with respect to the utilities, we did have a public EV public charging class. Was SMECO planning to, to create a separate class as well? Uh, yes, it was, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so we would see that in any tariff filing. Um, again, I, I appreciate the level of sort of the, the cost benefits, the societal NPV benefits. Um, public charging stations revenue requirements would be allocated to all customer classes. Um, you heard OPC, Mr. McDougall, uh, request that we explicitly direct your utility to buy, abide by all the requirements in orders 88997. Eight, eight, nine, nine, Does the utility have any concern with, uh, with that request by Mr. Raker? Um, Mr. Chairman, I, 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 I always hesitate when, you, when someone asks me whether I complied with all. But uh, I, I, c I could not, I cannot, as I sit here, think of one that we would not abide by. Um, uh, so um, uh, I, I know the staff mentioned the um, allocation of costs. I do note in the order that the commission ordered um, on page 66 that the, that the, where the commission found that a separate rate class for EV charging stations was warranted. Uh, again, we are going to be complying with that. It said, though, that the commission need not address the question of cost allocation at this time, but directed the utilities to develop a new rate class for EV charging stations and submit it in a, in a tariff proposal, uh, and that the commission would address cost allocation at the appropriate time in a future rate-based proceeding. Right, that's correct. So uh, that, that we we see that as the way to go. That's why I, I am more sympathetic with um, with your position, although I, I do respect uh, our staff's proposal as well. Um, I thought I read somewhere in your filing that there was a commitment to uh, to comply with the order. So per perhaps that's did I did I read that? I, I see that you, you might have a little concern with uh, uh, obligating the utility on the spot. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I can't think of any provision of the order that we would not comply with, so I will say yes, we will. Mr. McDougall, you, you also referenced uh, with respect to the order, we had an appendix attached, and that appendix, I believe it was either A or B, had a list of requirements that the larger IOUs would um, uh, use as essentially a guideline to filing their semi-annual, mid-year, and, and final uh, reports. And I believe Smeco said that they would follow the requirements of Order 88997. Um, I just wanted to clarify: Does the utility recognize that those are those are minimums? They're not. It's essentially the floor, not the the ceiling in terms of what we're we're looking at, and that the utility should work with the the staff work group to um, uh, develop their filing. The we're committed to doing okay. to doing that. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, Commissioners, Commissioner Richard. No, I also was very in, uh, 
know, happy with and impressed with the, uh, the, the filing and uh, was, was pleased to see commitments to uh, working with EVIC, particularly, or ZEVIC, uh, particularly uh, around the, the marketing. So, um, you know, as I read through it, I, I think I found, you know, a lot of the, uh, the things I was looking for. So um, that, that, was, that worked well for me. I, I, I'm glad to also hear the uh, comments uh, this morning. As you know, the uh, managed charging uh, was something that was important to the commission. And so hearing that uh, you are continuing to work on the time of use and having that up in 2021, I think is important. Also, I think some kind of a proposal, I don't know if it's in the works, for, uh, for incentivizing smart charging. I think that's an important part of uh, the, the, the larger order. So uh, is that something that the uh, that the uh, at this meco is, is, is considering as well yes once we become a little more comfortable with our ccmb upgrade that we've been talking about and we have that level of comfort you would see us return with a residential smart charging level two incentive program as well as the multifamily. i just don't have a date for the for you at this time on that okay um, and also i know with uh, zevic they're very uh, interested in this siting tool that they are, are developing uh, to be used across maryland and uh, are you are you familiar with that siting tool tool and um, you know, can you can you commit to working with with Zevic uh, and and look and, and using that with uh, you know along with your other uh, prioritization uh, you know plans for siting? Yes, uh, we can your, commit your, to that your, uh, infrastructure. Okay, good. Um, I think that's really all I had. I, I think also if, if uh, the co if the company is is okay with uh, OPC's recommendation, I would also like to endorse explicitly. Uh, uh, requiring that the company abide by the other uh, order. So. Mr. McDougall's on the record. Uh, Commissioner O'Donnell. I am, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, for bringing this proposal forward. Um, I'm obviously pleased uh, to see some infrastructure going in uh, throughout Southern Maryland. Um, we don't consider somebody who has to stay an extra day with us to be stuck, though. <laughs> um, it's kind of like a family visit. We want our brethren to come visit us, but at the end of the stay, we're typically happy that they leave. So we want to make sure they can get out uh, fine. Um, I'm going to ask staff. I'll come back to Smeco in a minute. Uh, Ms. Garofalo, you said, I think, in response to the chairman's question, that Smeco had a different structure, and that's why you were making a recommendation for a refiling with tariff. What did you mean by a different structure? Uh, they proposed that all the costs be allocated across the rate base. I, I believe. Let me let Mr. Well, McAuliffe explain that in um, more detail. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, Drew McAuliffe on behalf of staff. Um, really, the opening up for comment was really for any aspect um, of the proposal. Um, again, uh, you know, the previous utilities went through really a, a three-year process to get their final portfolio approved. Um, so we were just looking to open it up. I, I mean, we said 60 days. We could limit that if uh, the commission uh, uh, was agreeable to that. But we really were opening up just for stakeholders to comment on the scope, whether there should be more, fast chargers, less. Um, I mean, and they're also a cooperative, so that may there may be some issues with that. Um, we really just wanted to open it up to see if there's anything we may have missed. I mean, uh, that's always helpful to have more eyes to view the proposal. But um, I mean, as you saw through our comments, we were happy with most of the proposal we agreed with. We thought it complied with the order. But again, it was just really um, the procedures the other utilities had to go through was um, very extensive and strenuous. It was extremely yeah, vetted. I, I just, my own sense is because they are a co-op, they're self-governing. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're different in a way that would indicate to the to this commissioner at least that maybe we're on solid ground to to approve this proposal now without the further delay um, so it's kind of what it seems like to me um, what for the co-op what was the number 60 based on um, we benefited greatly from the other utilities going well before us, as just discussed. So we looked at what was initially filed, and then we looked at the order that came out, at, at greatly reducing what the uh, other utilities had asked for. So we took a good, hard look at the order and tried to find where we thought we could, with good confidence, install that level in the service territory, not have stranded assets, but also not be before you asking for something much greater than you've already approved. And and I understood you to say you are going to come back with a rebate type uh, program for residential? Level uh, two, yes, sir. 
and the multifamily. Okay. All right. Well, and you said you had good feedback from the counties. Uh, can you put a little more meat on the bone? Which counties and what kind of decisions? All the counties. All, uh, most all, of the all five? Well, four. the four. Um, so, yes, all the counties have uh, I'm have asked. Have part of Southern Anne Arundel. You have part of Southern Anne Arundel. We, we, we have two customers in yeah. Southern Anne Arundel. Two. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I discounted them. <laughs> I don't know we, if they've called. We count them all. <laughs> but yes, county governments, county school systems, local towns have reached out and have inquired when so we told them we're going through these proceedings and we'd be in touch yes yeah, so that's a good good the, so they were positively disposed and interested in very much so I, I suspect that'd be the case uh, i suspect there's not going to be opposition but uh, have you heard of any opposition no i haven't I've, I've nothing but positive even down to local uh, Uber and Lyft drivers who um, drive Teslas have been reaching out and inquiring where where we stand on this. So it's it's been nothing but positive. Fair enough. Thank you, Commissioner Linton. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just I didn't know there were Teslas and Uber. <laughs> 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 um, I also uh, am uh, appreciative that uh, Smeko has filed this uh, proposal. So I join my colleagues there. Uh, I am. Uh, I share uh, one of the, the concerns that OPC raised regarding the establishment of and, and bringing Smeco up to speed with the other companies regarding EM and EM and V. Uh, I know that uh, in your proposal, I guess this is on page uh, eight. Uh, you mentioned uh, your effort and your intention to collect data and to join in with the other companies in their uh, procurement for a third party evaluator and I'm curious if that discussion has happened are you kind of have you had any interaction with them so far we have not spoken with the other utilities at this point I know they have gone out I believe with RFP at this time mm -hmm. um, and, and are looking but we would look to talk to them if given approval to join in in that process and share in those costs okay do you, do you anticipate any any challenges in being able to do that I mean it's going less on the cost I guess for them but is, is there any if there's types of data they're proposing to collect that Smeco perhaps doesn't isn't able to collect at this time for example no um, I, I don't anticipate any challenges there we've been able to see what they've talked about in the hearings and what level of data and we are along with them through empower when it comes to EM and V so we're we're very accustomed to what EM and V means and what it expense it means as well as level of data and we think we can deliver okay they, so they also have a uh, time of use built into their programs and of course Michael's is still working on yours uh, so you think that 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 element of your proposal uh, will limit your ability to use the same contractor or is, is there ability to try and, and revise the I guess I'm just I'm trying to understand how the how it's going to merge together and if it's going to be seamless or are there going to be some bumps that our staff and perhaps other parties will have to figure out how to work through later uh, in, a, in a two or three or however many years later when it's time to look at this data right we, we may be lagging in delivering some of that <coughs> level of data because we wouldn't have the program ready mm -hmm. but I still would see us benefiting greatly in learning from the M&V results they're receiving to help guide what program changes we may do uh, may need to make in that very near future. Mm -hmm. I think we'd benefit. Okay. Um, all right. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Linton. If I could interject, um, yeah. the the chairman was discussing the template uh, that was at the end of the order uh, previously. Staff and the utilities are have nearly finalized that, and we could share that with Smeco because that also has um, requests for information of specific data, mm -hmm. um, so we could work with them to um, see if they need to have any improvements or if they can even collect that uh, granular level of data well the cooperative is already on the record is uh, having yeah. support the order so right <laughs> but mr. McCullough you, you you raise a good point that you have been working with the other utilities to mm -hmm. because we said as I said the the floor and you've been putting some additional touches yeah. on that so um, the utility should work with with staff on uh, with respect to the um, reporting requirements in the appendix Commissioner Herman. 
So, uh, uh, Ms. Garofalo and Mr. McAuliffe, uh, this was filed on May 14th, 2019, so that's like already two and a half months, and it sounds like there's quite a bit of public interest in this, given the fact that SMECO has said that they've already had counties and, and local jurisdictions reaching out. Do you, do you, do you think that that um, therefore constitutes, you know, sufficient notice to, to the public that this is going on, given the ongoing proceedings that we've had and that we've been active in EVs, that, that people who are interested, I mean, we haven't received any other comments from, from anyone else um, since May 14th, since this was filed. So um, is, is there, uh, you know, is, is, can you explain to me why you think that might not be adequate notice? Because to me, I think that's quite, it's two and a half months and, and we've been very active in this field, so people watching the Maryland Public Service Commission with respect to EVs, would you would expect they would be following and keeping an eye on things? Uh, I, I I guess um, considering it was filed as a, a, a administrative filing, a buck sheet, I, I'm not sure that everybody was made aware, because um, as you know, with the the compliance filings, the commission specifically sent a letter saying it was open to comments. Um, we didn't well, have but the, any any time anybody files something at sure. the Maryland Public Service, this was not filed on a confidential basis. This right. was this was just out there, right? I mean, yeah. and that's how that's one of the ways we provide notice to people that we have. You know, you can go on to the commission website and and uh, and and look to see what's been filed that day or that week. Isn't right. that right? Yes. Yeah. I I 100 percent agree. I guess we were just assuming that not everybody was made aware of this filing as the other ones were. And by everybody, you mean? Anybody that may be interested. I mean, to, to know that this was filed, you, I believe you would have to have checked the case jacket on a daily basis to see, oh, okay, Southern Maryland um, Electric Cooperative filed something in this case. I don't, I don't think any, any uh, notice was sent out to any mm -hmm. interested stakeholders or parties like the portfolio was, for example. Ms. Garofalo? So certainly people would have constructive notice of this. Um, I, we were looking for something a little bit more that of like actual notice, but, mm -hmm. um, but you're correct. If you issued an order, that would still be constructive notice. Right. And just two quick Mr. points. Mm -hmm. Commissioner, I think the fact that we had so many comments, even in support of the utility pro pro proposals in 9478, and the fact that we haven't had any here maybe says something too. And I would also add that if, if the um, cooperative will be filing a, a tariff shortly after this um, ad administrative meeting that that tariff will have some some time for review as well and so if we don't say 60 days but maybe 30 days when we gather back to review that tariff that could be a point in time when the commission rules on the proposal and the tariff as well and that would be possibly adequate comment period mm -hmm. should a notice be issued for comment so that might be an alternative route okay thank you mr chairman thank you uh commissioner herman uh Perhaps staff could help me out here. Um, when would SMECO's first um, report be due to the commission? Would that be next February? Um, you know, I, I, I guess if they're if they're not um, if if their program is approved after August first, I would imagine it would be because the first report's due August first. Uh, okay, tomorrow. Uh, yeah, we don't need so, to report uh, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess yeah, theirs would go to the next reporting period. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you. And to Mr. Raker, I believe that uh, after today, for those in the community uh, who were not aware, uh, I suspect that this will ha they'll have some type of notice either in the press or, uh, or otherwise, and they'll have an opportunity at a future date to, uh, to be on the lookout for uh, the future tariff filing that SMECA will make and have an opportunity to, to participate in the nuts and bolts of, of that filing that's going to be forthcoming at some future date. I know, Mr. McDougall, you said you would... Uh, rush to get it here. I think you need to get it right rather than get it done quickly. I do recognize that um, according to your proposal, you want to have, what, six chargers in by the end of the year? Is that right? Mr. Yes, that's six. in our initial proposal, okay. yes. All right, so, and you'll roll them out over the course of five years to get to 60, so. Uh, and where those first six go? Leslie. Leslie. <laughs> 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 Not for me, for the chairman. <laughs> <laughs> with, uh, with that, unless there's any more questions, is there a motion? 
Mr. Chairman, I move the commission to approve the application as submitted, including a maximum limitation of 20 DC fast chargers, and further directs MECO to file a public EV charging tariff at a future date consistent with order number 88997 and case number 9478. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no additional business before the commission, this meeting is adjourned.